All right, here we are at chapter seven. Chapter seven um, engages with um, sociological theories. So we're, we're taking it from a, um, a sociological perspective and we're gonna be looking specifically at social structure. Social structure refers to things like the physical conditions of certain environments. It's gonna look at relationships that people have within certain environments as well as things like hierarchy, how society is structured, how people are ranked according to things like class, prestige, and power. Um, we'll look at things like schools in certain areas, um, gangs, the political power associated, as well as um, money and how that influences kind of some of these external factors. Um, we know that these external factors um, affect certain individuals' behaviors or attitudes, and that environment can make normal people commit serious offenses. So oftentimes we think of our personalities as pretty fixed, right? Either you're a happy person, you're, I don't know, humorous, um, you're outgoing, you're friendly, you're moody, whatever. We all can kind of reflect and think about certain characteristics that, um, you know, we identify with. Um, but Oftentimes, we don't realize that our personalities aren't really fixed, and, and this is kind of new research coming out. Um, it's oftentimes the situation that determines how we will react. So I'll give you an example from my own life. I'm a pretty easygoing person, um, you know, especially around my family. I'm funny. I like to think of myself as funny, right? Um, I really try to be kind to my daughter, who is four. Um, I do a lot of these things, you know, hoping that, you know, I'll be raising a good person and things like that. Um, now, this, when the situation changes, um, I have what I'm realizing is almost a phobia of the dentist. And so um, I'm usually pretty, I'm okay once, you know, I'm sitting in the room and things like that. But once I'm in the chair, um, I'm, you know, I have a lot of kind of neuroses going on in my head. I'm considering jumping out of the chair. Um, and so that real, you know, outgoing, easygoing person, friendly person isn't always there while I'm at the dentist. Um, I noticed even in certain, like even when I'm done, I'm not very friendly to my dentist. Um, I always wonder if he has to be as harsh as I feel he is. Um, so you can see how the environment can definitely change, um, you know, how your personality, who you are as a person. And so we're realizing that these situational factors are oftentimes a lot more influential than things like personality traits, which have traditionally been known as being in fixed and things like that. Um, after you watch this lecture today, you're gonna to be watching a short video called The Lucifer Effect. And this was um, uh, put together by a man named Philip Zimbardo. And he's gonna talk a little bit about his prison study as well as how it relates to what we've seen in the real world in regards to um, the abuses that took place um, at Abu Ghraib, um, the, uh, a prison in, in Iraq. So um, we know, um, again, um, you know, Zimbardo will talk to you and say that, that that line between good and evil is permeable. We all have the ability to be a Mother Teresa type character or to be a Lucifer type character, to be the villain or to be the hero. Um, it really all depends on the situation in which we're in. So in this chapter, we're going to look at what leads certain individuals into committing certain types of crime in regards to like that environment or that situation, right? So we're going to um, look at why crime varies across location. Um, we'll also look at um, some of those structural conditions that I discussed earlier. Our chapter objectives for this um, chapter, we're going to look and appreciate Emile Durkheim's contributions towards understanding deviance as a normal phenomenon and the influence of structural forces on individual behavior. We're going to become familiar with the social disorganization and social ecology approaches, including the work of Park and Burgess, Shaw and McKay, and more recent revivals of these approaches, especially with regard to economic deprivation and Stark's theory of deviant places. We're going to be able to critique social disorganization theory. We're going to become familiar with anomie theory, including Merton's typology of logical adaptations to anomie and the defense and extension of this approach.
We're going to first start by talking about Emile Durkheim. So Durkheim was the father of sociology. He did a lot of work when it came to crime and deviance. Durkheim believed that crime and deviance was really normal and healthy for any, you know, society. He believed that society did a really good job at limiting people's personal um, aspirations um, to essentially do what's best for the society. So what does that mean? Let me give you an example. Um, say there's a new iPod that comes out and you really, really want it. Your last one broke. You don't have the money for it. What is it that keeps you from stealing that iPod? Right. Um, for many of us, we don't want to get in trouble. Right. We just don't want to spend time in jail. Maybe um, we wouldn't want a police a call from the police to our um, parents. Um, and it, in other in another sense, so many of us know that our conscience would bother us too much to, to even engage in an act like this. And so Durkheim really attributed that, you know, societal constraint that that to society. Right. We've been socialized to say, hey, what you're doing is wrong. Um, you shouldn't do that. Um, we learn this through the socialization process. So as we're growing up, um, if you watch a mother or father with their toddler, they're constantly correcting their toddler um, and essentially, you know, telling them how you're supposed to function in society. So when my daughter was two or three, I remember I went to go pick up food, takeout, and um, she ran behind the counter where the lady was um, you know, ringing up the food. And of course, the woman wasn't upset. It was a two-year-old doing this. Um, she recognized that, you know, this little girl hadn't learned all of the rules of society. And of course, as her mother, I called her over and said, oh no, don't do that. Um, had my daughter been 18 and gone behind the counter at a restaurant, there probably would have been um, much harsher, or you know, repercussions for that act. Um, you know, that clerk might have defined the situation as someone trying to rob her or something like that and of course her personality would change as well right it's, it really depends on how you define the situation Durkheim believed that it was the social ties we had to society that helped us integrate and um, when people were lacking or not having these social ties it would make them more prone to crime so if we think of someone for instance um, like foster kids um, it's a really unfortunate situation because these children were never given the opportunity to have parents in the way that many of us have experienced. And so we're almost, in a sense, setting them up for failure. But foster kids have very high rates of offending. Um, and I think Durkheim's theory about social ties really helps explain why foster kids are very likely to end up incarcerated you know, sometime in their life. Um, not having parents, right, who are guiding you morally, but also someone to answer to, um, you know, along with, you know, a myriad of other things. But that's just a good kind of example. Durkheim used a, um, a study on suicide to help explain how these external factors will influence us. His um, study on, of su on suicide had... Um, had to do with one's loss of connection that people, you know, feel, um, and he called this um, anomie. So anomie is a very famous um, concept in sociology. But he believed that when people, you know, when norms became unpredictable or people didn't feel like part of something or felt that loss of connection, that they were more likely to commit suicide. Um, and so it helped explain a lot of different kind of statistics and characteristics that we see around suicide. So for one, males are more likely to commit suicide. Um, we can explain that from Durkheim's theory, looking at the idea that men are much less likely to reach out in a time of trouble. So Durkheim's study on suicide was really a watershed in understanding how social ties influence one's level of integration and how that relates to suicide as well. He also looked at groups, um, religious groups. Um, he studied Catholics and Protestants. Um, he looked at married couples um, and he looked at um, people with children. And he found that uh, married couples were less likely to commit suicide. Again, you have like a built-in best friend. 
People with children were less likely to commit suicide with the understanding that parents have the responsibility to take care of these children. So even if you weren't really happy, um, you might stick around to, you know, not do that to your children. Um, it was also really interesting because Durkheim found that even during a time of peace, there were higher levels of suicide, and that was one that I always found most interesting. Um, and the whole idea behind that is um, during a time of war, there's high levels of social integration. People come together, um, you know, everyone's working for a common cause, they have a common enemy, and there's less presence of suicide. So working off of Emile Durkheim's theories and how social ties integrate individuals into society, we had um, the development of the social disorganization theory. And social disorganization could be best understood by looking at the breakdown of social bonds and social controls. So Thomas and Zanecki, um, they looked specifically at immigrant kids who were engaging in crime, and they found that a lot of the time their um, involvement in crime can be understood by looking at the conflict between um, the norms that their parents had and the new norms of the society or the differences in culture. Um, just to give you some perspective, um, when I taught at Mount Sac, I always remember one of my students who was, a, who was of Asian descent and she was first generation, um, she was discussing how her parents didn't really understand a lot of the norms surrounding um, American high school um, social groups and stuff like that. So for instance, her parents wouldn't let her go to prom, they wouldn't let her date. She wasn't allowed to engage in some of the regular um, activities that you know high school kids in America engage in. And she was telling the class how you know she was really trying to talk her parents into like, hey, you don't understand prom, grad night, all of this stuff is a really big uh, you know deal for us um, and her parents just you know wouldn't let her there were just differences in culture um, I've heard the same one of my best friends is was born in Czechoslovakia and outwardly you think she'd be really popular in high school but she wasn't um, she's really pretty and she's um, really outgoing um, but her parents wouldn't let her do anything she wasn't allowed to go to slumber parties she wasn't allowed and she really you know she reflects on this now and it really bothered her um, so when looking at these differences in norms from the parents and the children, um, um, Thomas and Zanecki were able to kind of come up with the idea that, you know, these kids really had conflicting um, uh, norms um, and that those social bonds were kind of broken down. There was less social control. Um, we can also look at social disorganization theory with the Industrial Revolution. So as people move from the farms, they move from agrarian livelihoods to um, working in factories. Um, they found that it actually made people less personal. Um, there was a higher importance of money. Um, it created a hierarchy. So you had bosses and you had workers. Um, and this was very true for like a lot of immigrants at the time as well. And so you might think people moving into the cities would actually make people more integrated or create more social ties. But think about, you know, the fact that if you were all farmers, then you all depended on the same thing. You all, you know, had a common interest in, you know, the weather being okay and your crops working or growing. Um, but in um, uh, the factories, there was a little bit, it's, I suppose, a little bit more superficial and everybody's goals and norms are um, different. And so um, you could start to see the breakdown of some of those bonds and ties. The next set of theorists that looked at social disorganization were Burgess and Parks. And they looked at social ecology. And um, think about ecology as like the study of the earth. And they used the analogy of plants. Um, and they said, you know, people were like plants. Um, they had to have the right soil in order to thrive. So, for instance, you know, you or climate, right? So you can't grow a palm tree in Antarctica; it just won't happen. Um, or even, you know, in in any environment, if the soil is bad, the um, the plant won't grow. And so he 
use that analogy to explain people. If people are in bad environments, they won't grow. Um, they will turn to deviance and crime um, because you know that's you know where it goes. And then um, next we'll talk about um, Shaw and McKay who looked at, looked at concentric zones in the inner Chicago areas. Um, and I have a you know specific slide um, next. And all of these um, theorists were known as the Chicago School of Criminology. They were um, very big at the time. All right, so now we're going to go a little bit more in detail with Shaw and McKay's analysis of the concentric zones. Um, so they came up with um, certain zones and characteristics associated with those zones. In zone one, which was known as the loop, this was considered the, the city center. Um, this is where you saw a lot of housing and retail businesses, um, some light manufacturing. In the inner zone, this is where we see it saw lots of social disorganization, um, partly because you had an immigrant population at the time that was constantly changing. So um, immigrants generally oftentimes come as poor. Um, they don't have a lot of resources or social ties. So they go into these inner cities, um, those, you know, this concentric part. Um, they do maybe low menial labor, things like that. They face a lot of discrimination. If you look at our history, Irish Americans, Germans, um, uh, Polish, Jewish people, Italians were very much um, stigmatized and discriminated against in our, some of our early history or immigrant history. Um, and so, but as these groups did better, they started to move outward. So in zone two, you saw um, the ghettos, the slums, places like Little Sicily, Chinatown. Um, and this is where most of those people lived. So they lived surrounding that zone one, that city center. Um, and so that's the, the second zone. As the zones um, progressed, you had zone three. This is where you had um, a second immigrant establishment. Um, so, you know, the whole point is like, everyone's trying to move to a better area and, and generally the, the pattern was moving outward. In um, zone four, this is where you had single family dwellings, residential hotels, uh, bright lit areas, apartment buildings. And then lastly, you had your bungalows or commuter sections. And so what they found were that, as like I said, as people moved out, they did better. So there was something about you know, these inner zones that um, contributed to high levels of crime and delinquency. And the belief was essentially that you know, um, crime and deviance were a real normal response to some of the abnormal conditions that were happening within these concentric zones. It's really interesting because eventually mo most of the white ethnicities moved out. So um, Irish people, German, German people, they all ended up, you know, kind of moving out, Italians. Um, and they don't face the same type of stigma that they did 150 years ago, 200 years ago. Um, part of that is because white ethnics were able to integrate into the society. And for instance, I'm an Irish American. Um, but you wouldn't be able to tell just by looking at me because you would probably just say I'm just white. I know, you know, I don't have an accent. I don't have like, you know, cultural dress or rituals or things like that that I'm doing. Um, and so a lot of white ethnic groups were able to kind of escape into the outer zones and do much better for themselves. Um, but what's interesting is that um, in a lot of these places in Chicago, they were replaced with um, um, minorities, so minority groups, African Americans, um, Hispanics, Latinos, and um, because of skin color and discrimination based on skin color, um, many of these groups were never able to fully escape. Um, there were other structural inequalities involved that contributed this to as well. What a lot of people don't realize is that the slums were pretty much created because the FDA or the FHA, sorry, wouldn't um, write housing loans in these areas. So people that lived in these areas were never able to fully um, kind of get out. Um, the other side, when it came to um, uh, home ownership, only about 2% of um, 
home loans were given to African Americans. So they, they weren't even writing loans um, in these areas. And so it was really a, a setup for making a ghetto, and that's, that's what ended up happening. All right, so working off of what we just learned in regards to um, Shaw and McKay's research on concentric zones, they applied this concentric zone model to a study of juvenile delinquency. Um, and what they found were that there were also individual factors that helped it explain who would actually commit certain offenses. Um, but they argued less, um, uh, less offenses would be committed if they lived in a different community um, or a community where there was more integration. So keep in mind too, when people are constantly trying to move out of their area because, you know, especially the good people, right? Because they want to live in a good area, you have a lot of social disorganization or instability, right? The norms, um, the, the culture, in the same way we see like with the, the city of Vegas. Um, and I forgot to mention this when talking about Anna Me. But Vegas actually um, has very high levels of suicide. When I bring that up to students, their first ideas are, you know, said something like, oh, well, people, it's a city of sin, or people um, gambled their life savings. You know, that's always their explanation as to why there's so much suicide in Las Vegas. But if you're using Durkheim's ideas in, group, in regards to social ties, um, we know that Vegas is a town or a city in which people are constantly going in and constantly coming out. So there's low um, stability, right? People are constantly moving in and out. So for the people who live there, um, this is a, t a city that's in constant transition. And it helps explain that it's going to be a lot harder to create those social ties. Um, when things are changing so much. And I think that really relates to some of these concentric zones as well. Um, when you have good people who, you know, their main goal is to get out, um, then, you know, there's going to be a lot of instability. And then there's also going to be, who are you going to be left with? People who um, maybe are engaging in the criminal element. So, um, Clifford and, or Shaw and McKay discovered that areas that were characterized by low socioeconomic status, um, in residential instability, and um, uh, a lot of different ethnicities living together had an issue that would later be um, characterized as social disorganization like we discussed. Um, they believe that social disorganized areas had two main characteristics. For one, they lacked um, formal social controls. Um, things like institutions, um, uh, like the family or churches or schools, um, which oftentimes would free individuals up to engage in delinquency. Maybe you didn't have a lot of families who were intact or um, kind of community, you know, a sense of community, which is good for, you know, keeping crime down. Um, and that there was a, also a process of cultural transmission in which criminal traditions were passed down from generation to generation. Um, this can also be explained when it comes to gang activity. Oftentimes, um, a lot of times, gangs are just a bunch of family members. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, I remember talking to a friend who had been incarcerated for gang activity as a youth. And he was explaining to me that, you know, growing up, I think he lived in Compton or, or um, L.A., and he explained that you had to join a gang for protection or you were going to get punked every day. And so him and his cousins got together and they formed a gang. And it was just, you know, a bunch of cousins together and um, uh, forming this as for a sense of protection or solidarity. Um, so they... Um, a lot of this can be passed down from generation to generation, right? Your family is in a gang. The expectation is that you will be in the gang as well. Um, Clifford and, I always call him Clifford, Sean McKay also found that um, rates of offending remained constant over time within these zones of trans, um, transition, despite high rates of immigration and movement from the inner cities and the suburbs. Um, and we know that this still really holds true today. For those people who um, are being let out of prison, so parolees who are being released, we know that when they are released into high-income good areas, they do better. 
Um, and so when I worked with parole, I would go to these, um, these, you know, go out to the houses with the parole agents and things like that. And sometimes I was a little surprised. I mean, I would enter into these. Oftentimes the houses were really dumpy. Actually, the first house I ever went to, we showed up and the guy was dead, which was not very typical, but definitely um, provided me a story. <laughs> Some of my experience working with parole. But, um, I, you know, sometimes I would go into these houses in Chino Hills and they were much nicer houses than anything I had ever expected or even been in. Um, and it wasn't a big surprise when I found out that, you know, these were the people who were doing okay. They had a lot of social ties. Their families had money. They were able to kind of reintegrate them back in. Um, you know, a lot of it has to do with access. Do you have family members who can get you a job? Do you have family members who care? And then even if they can get you a job, what type of job, right? Is this a job at Walmart or is this a job that's going to be, you know, enough to really sustain yourself? All right, so next we're going to talk about this intersection of like social disorganization as it relates to um, economic de deprivation, which, which leads to what's known as concentrated disadvantage. Um, so we know that poverty rates do increase crime. A lot of that has to do with things like not having good jobs in these areas or um, not having maybe the education for a good job. In high poverty or um, areas with lots of social disorganization, you have more people on the streets. In turn, you have more people turning to drugs. You have more broken families. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of stress um, when you are poor and living in some of these conditions. Um, so poverty essentially can generate more social disorganization and undermines traditional social control mechanisms that you see in other um, types of neighborhoods. Oftentimes we also know that the underclass live in um, a continued cycle of concentrated disadvantage. So they face lots of racial discrimination, housing segregation. Oftentimes um, there's what's called white flight where whites will move out and, um, as soon as minorities are moving in. Um, many people in these areas will turn to crime, maybe out of fear, um, sometimes out of anger, other times out of economic need, um, which is known as, um, you know, and of course that's known as relative deprivation. Um, so as a result, with the social disorganization leading to economic de deprivation and um, continuing on into what's known as a cycle of poverty. Um, and I think it's understandable um, how some of these members, you know, might turn to um, commit crimes to for whatever reasons. Um, but I want to be clear, actually, that most people that live in high poverty areas do not engage in criminality. So um, I think I just said something similar to that. But um, um, that's also interesting. So there are individual factors. Why is it that? You know, one person will turn to crime and the other one won't. And that's what we'll talk about next. Another theorist in criminology whose name was Rodney Stark, he compared the kinds of places to kinds of people, and Stark contended that there must be something about places that actually sustain crime. So he really felt that it was the environment more than the individual. Um, and this is known as the theory of DVM places. He focused a lot on the physical characteristics of certain neighborhoods. He found that the more dense a neighborhood or the more people you have living in a you know, um, smaller spatial area, the greater the likelihood um, good kids would come in contact with bad kids. Um, you also know that uh, if you're living in an apartment or something with lots of people, um, then you have a higher likelihood of going outside. Um, that really helps explain what happened um, during the crack epidemic at, of the 1980s. Um, a lot of the crack use was pushed out into the streets because people were living in, you know, homes with a lot of other family members. And so he saw, saw a lot of that going on in the streets. Um, there are other structural conditions, things like um, dilapidated housing, um, liquor stores, um, residents feeling kind of stigmatized which often prompts like non-deviant people to move out. Um, 
and also sometimes people were afraid to call police. Um, so think about the structural conditions, think about the neighborhoods that you grow up in and how they um, might perpetuate crime in certain ways. Um, I lived all over the Inland Empire when I was down there. Um, I lived in really nice neighborhoods and I lived in uh, kind of um, a little a little rougher neighborhoods. Um, when I lived in Ontario, I found that um, there were liquor stores almost inside of our neighborhoods. Um, and that was very, very different than what I experienced when I lived in Northern Laverne with my parents, um, where, you know, you were two miles away from any type of liquor store. Um, also, I noticed things like the way the streets are set up. Um, in higher income areas, you have kind of more of a flowing um, setup uh, where, you know, streets are curving, you have nice landscaping. When I lived in Laverne, the city would actually get on you if you weren't doing things like mowing your lawn or keeping your house painted. Um, and that's where they have, uh, I think they're called HOA, you know, um, rules if you live in certain housing developments that you, you have to keep up. Um, and some of it, you know, if you think about it, like you're not even allowed to have, like have a home daycare in some of these places. Um, you're only allowed to have, to have so many cars on the streets. And all of that is based on some of these ideas of creating an environment of um, a tune with like, you know, a community, a sense of community that would, you know, lead to less level or lower levels of criminality. So as I mentioned, with most of these theories, there are going to be several critiques, which is really good because it gets us to start thinking about where these theories fall short. Um, so one of the biggest critiques associated with social disorganized, uh, disorganization theory is the heavy reliance on using official records for measuring crime and deviance. So for instance, um, boys who were um, growing up, maybe, or you know, juveniles who were um, growing up in um, the higher end areas were first of all less likely to be caught um, and so they would be less likely to be represented in the records. So it wouldn't actually, if we're using official records, it wouldn't give us an accurate representation of what's really going on because of those reasons. Um, there was also an imprecision in the concept of disorganization. Um, Certain um, theorists or critics believe that, you know, there were a lot of assumptions made and that you can't necessarily assume that there is no sense of community or that um, these areas are, are highly disorganized. Um, because as I mentioned, there are plenty of people who um, live in these high crime zone areas who are not offenders. The next theory we're going to engage with comes from a man named Robert Merton, and Robert Merton coined the um, theory strain theory, and he was working off of Durkheim's theory of anomie, which, um, but he looks specifically at um, the inability for certain individuals to achieve cultural goals or legitimate cultural goals. Um, using what he called socially, um, you know, approved means, um, because he believed that these weren't necessarily equally available to all members of society, and he essentially said that crime and deviance are alternative means to success when an individual feels the strain um, of being pressed to succeed in socially approved ways. Um, and we're going to give you some specific examples here in a few minutes. Um, the fact that these um, particular, not all individuals have the tools to achieve success. So maybe things like education or um, opportunity. So Merton's strain theory did a really good job of explaining rates of offending by the poor. Um, and again, the strain happens when, um, you know, people don't have access to the cultural goals. Um, so if you think of um, the goals of our society, generally being a capitalistic society um, in America, a lot of our goals are surrounding money or stuff. 
right? The, the American dream is to have the house, the kids, whatever. Um, and he said that depending on your cer certain situation, um, individuals would adapt um, to anomie in particular ways. So the first adaptation to anomie was conformity. A conformist would essentially accept the means um, of achieving the goals. And so what I mean by that is, um, so they want the goals, they want all the stuff, but they're going to use socially acceptable means of achieving them. So the conformist would be someone maybe like yourself, who is a student, um, who is you know going to school, which is something that's socially acceptable, um, in order to achieve the goals that you have, which are probably to make money one day, right? And so most of you would be considered a conformist. Merton believed, though, that not everyone had that type of access, right? Maybe you didn't go to a great high school that prepped you well enough to enter into college. And he believed that um, certain people would adapt and they would be innovators. So an innovator still has all of the goals of the society, but they don't necessarily use conventionally acceptable means. Um, so for an example, um, an innovator would be someone like a drug dealer, right? They want the money and the stuff, but they are going to deal drugs in order to attain that. The next adaptation to anomie was the ritualist. And so the ritualist I always thought was the type of person who's probably the happiest. The ritualist doesn't, isn't striving for societal goals. They don't need to be rich or powerful or anything else. But they definitely have the means to achieve the goals if that's what they wanted to do. So um, a good example of a ritualist might be someone who was just going to school, not necessarily for to make all of that money or to do all of that stuff, but just maybe for um, the value of having an education or having additional knowledge. Um, this is someone maybe who gets up and goes to work every day, but isn't necessarily striving to you know move up in the company or whatever, um, but just kind of going through the rituals. The next adaptation to anomie is the retreatist. The retreatist doesn't accept the goals and they don't accept the means of achieving the goals. So this person is probably someone who retreats from society. Um, if, if you've ever seen the film um, Into the Wild, I always think of um, that guy as being a retreatist. He was someone who went to go live in a, a bus out in, I think it was Alaska, um, to be kind of disconnected from the rest of society. So I think um, another example would be perhaps a homeless person who has chosen um, to, you know, not have a nine to five and not have a home and kind of living um, in a different subculture. Lastly, we have the rebel. The rebel comes up with new institutional goals and means um, of achieving those goals. So an example could go of the rebel, also known as maybe an anarchist. Um, it could really vary. It could be someone as significant as Martin Luther King, who obviously came up with his own goals and used nonviolent protests to achieve those goals. But it can also include someone um, like Osama bin Laden, right? Someone who um, has new goals for society and uses, um, you know, um, socially unacceptable uh, means of achieving those goals. Right? And so. Um, you know, depending on how people, you know, what um, adaptation they go into can really help, um, you know, explain things like why people kind of, um, uh, why certain rates of offending are, happen by the poor um, or by the rich or, or whatever. All right, so the next theory we're going to go over is general strain theory, which was developed by a man named Robert Agnew. And Agnew believe, believed that events occurring close in time can cause stress, and essentially repeated stress would lead to delinquency. Um, and I personal, on a personal note, I feel like I, I really believe in Agnew's theory. Um, if you've ever had, it's one thing having a bad day or a bad month. Um, but if you've ever had a bad year, like where you're just like, wow, what else could happen? Um, I know my husband and I both had health problems one year, you know, somewhat major. Um, on top of that, we were kind of drowning in medical debt. And um, it's probably not surprising that we became very stressed. 
a little angry. Um, there was just a lot going on and um, it just never seemed like it was going to end. And so um, I could totally understand why certain individuals would maybe turn to drugs during a time like this or alcohol. Um, and so Agnew looked specifically at juveniles and he felt that um, uh, certain events or conditions could lead people into kind of a delinquent lifestyle. Um, so the first one was fail to, failure to achieve positively valued goals. Um, so maybe, you know, you can't find a job in this economy or the only job you can find is, um, you know, one that doesn't pay very much or one that doesn't have a lot of status. He also believed that with that, if you had something like the removal of a positive, um, positively valued stimuli, let's say you broke up with your girlfriend or your boyfriend who was a really good influence on you, or let's say during this really hard time that my husband and I were going through, he said he wanted to divorce me, <laughs> right, which would even be um, an even more confounding issue. Um, so during these times, if you have the third variable, which is um, like the presentation of, you know, someone comes to you and says, hey, you want to try drugs or you want to try, um, you know, to engage in crime or whatever, um, he believed that that would more likely lead to things like strain. Um, and again, especially true for juveniles um, who may not have developed may not have developed the correct coping mechanisms for dealing with some of this really, really high stress stuff. Um, but he believed that, you know, these components could add to um, the likely, higher likelihood of engagement in criminality. All right, the last theory we'll look at is the subculture of violence. This was developed by Marvin Wolfgang and Franco Ferracuti. Um, the subculture of violence engages with the idea that um, there are high levels of violence among lower class boys. Um, part of this is most likely due to the, the, the need to defend one's um, masculinity. So in a culture or in a society or a neighborhood in which you know, they're not really able to, um, I don't know, look at themselves in, in a high light because they're maybe not the greatest at school or their schools are so bad, you know. Um, they don't have a lot of, um, kind of, a lot of things invested in other avenues. And so when someone does something like, um, in, you know, um, threaten their masculinity or call them a name or something like that, they might feel like they need to defend their masculinity, right? Because it's kind of all they have. Um, and oftentimes in these lower class areas, that's really, really important, right? So if you live in a neighborhood where you don't have access to a good job, um, so you're already feeling bad about that, right? You can't, you know, um, provide for your family or you don't have good schools, so you're not really excelling in that way. Um, you can see why a threat to your masculinity, why you might be more likely to want to defend that um, as, opposed, uh, as opposed to maybe an individual who does have access to all of those other avenues. Um, this theory is controversial because it carries um, racial implications. The idea that you know, lower class people are more um, violent is very controversial. Um, there is a lot of research that found that the poor don't approve of violence uh, more than any other group um, and that you know, black males don't are any more violent than white males. So um, it's an interesting theory. There is a lot of kind of controversy around it though. All right.